Uh, first, I just want to welcome all of you to um, this, um, I think, what will be an incredibly compelling conversation today. Um, could we share the PowerPoint screen, please? Um, anyways, well, I'm Cassandra Koblenz. I'm Senior Curator and Director of Public Engagement at the Orange County Museum of Art. And I'm really delighted to be presenting this program, a historical lens on Noe Martinez, Homeland of the Images, that is currently on view at the Orange County Museum of Art. Unfortunately, we are not fully able to be open or not able to be open to the public, but we hope that we will be able to uh, reopen again soon. So please keep an eye out and, and check our website. And we hope that um, those of you who are local will have an opportunity to see this exhibition in person because it is, it is really quite stunning. Um, before um, I get into the content of our program today, I just wanted to share some logistics with all of you. Uh, for this program, uh, Noe will be speaking in Spanish, while uh, Ruth, Andres, and myself will be speaking in English. And we have a simultaneous interpreter for Noe. And so all of you at the bottom of your screen, you have, um, you'll see this little icon for interpretation, where the blue arrow is pointing. And you can select the language um, for when Noe is speaking that you want to hear him speaking in. So if you'd like to hear him speak in English, you click, oh, can you go back to the little image? Um, you click on the little globe symbol that you can see there, and then you can select English, Spanish, or off. And if you select off, you um, will hear, um, you know, you won't have any interpretation, but um, you are welcome to experiment with this and see what you like if you speak both English and Spanish and to toggle back and forth between uh, whichever um, um, setting you like throughout the program. But uh, like I said, most of the program will be in English, um, but we really felt it was important for Noe to be able to express himself as fully as possible and for you to understand him as completely as possible. We will also have a question and answer period after the program or uh, after the primary program. Um, and you'll see at the bottom of your of your screen, there's a little Q&A tab and you're welcome to type your questions there um, at any point throughout the program. And then as I said, after our speakers have finished, um, we'll get to the questions and hopefully answer as many of them for you as possible. Um, so I'll just, I wanted to give you a little bit of context for this exhibition and how it, it ended up uh, being presented for us today, um, for all of you today, um, as part of this program. We, uh, the museum, as, as many of you might know, is um, in a transitional moment, and we have a temporary location uh, in Santa Ana, where we have been really exploring in a deep and complex way what it means for us as an institution to have been focusing on artists from California and the Pacific Rim. Um, and so in my efforts to do that and create this dynamic program, we've been uh, working with artists from all over the Pacific Rim, including Mexico, and, and also working with guest curators, because we're really trying to kind of provide um, as, as rich and complex a picture of what the um, culture and political context of what it means for us to have that geographical focus as an art museum and a contemporary art museum and institution here in California. So um, along those lines, um, I have been talking to Ruth Estevez and, um, and you know, and for a long time we've known each other and uh, I have always appreciated her perspective. And so when we had the opportunity for her to guest curate an exhibition, I was thrilled to be able to work with her. So. Um, so yes, Ruth, it's been such a pleasure and a gift to get to have um, your incredible insight and curatorial perspective as part of our program at Acme Expand. Um, and, and she is the one who brought Noe Martinez to us and Noe, we're also so grateful and thank you to both of you. It's been a really unusual and unexpected time to have curated and presented an exhibition during a pandemic and also during um, this moment of real um, oh, sort of reckoning with the history of racism, racism and social justice um, in, in the US and, and everywhere. And this show has been, um, I think for us, it's been really important because it has, uh, it really speaks to the, um, the history that I think all of us are, are interested in challenging our own thinking in the past about and learning more 
are about. So it's really important for the museum that we've been able to present this work right now and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce Ruth uh, to you briefly and then Ruth will introduce Andres and Noe and talk a little bit about the sort of general context for the exhibition. So Ruth Estevez is a curator and writer. Her curatorial approach is influenced by her interest in the historical relationship between theater and the visual arts. She is artistic director of Amant Foundation in New York and co-curator of the 34th Sao Paulo Biennale. From 2018 to, to 2020, she was senior curator at, curator at large for the Rose Museum in Boston and curator of Idiorhythmias, <laughs> the program of performance, music, poetry, and text at the NACBA in Barcelona. Prior to that, she was director and curator at the Red Cat Cal Arts in Los Angeles, where she worked with numerous internationally recognized artists and curated many significant group exhibitions. Before Red Cat, she was the chief curator, curator at the Carrillo Gil Museum in Mexico City, where she also founded Liga, a space for architecture, which she still runs, uh, and, and a nonprofit platform focused on experimentation in architecture, urbanism, and public art. So again, Ruth, thank you you for being with us today and I will hand it over, hand the mic over to you <laughs> so to speak to take it from here. And so um, well first of course thank you Cassandra and Okma Museum for your kind introduction and also again for inviting me to organize this exhibition of Noé Martínez, La Patria de las Imágenes, the homeland of the images. As part of this series of exhibitions that you have been organizing very successfully, I have to say, in the past uh, few years, I guess, like it has been already a few years that you're organizing this group of exhibitions. It's really true that it was a pity that this exhibition wasn't able to be open to the public for longer time due to the plague, to the circumstances. <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's really important that we are able to talk today about the subjects that are behind this project and the context uh, of this exhibition that of course is, is there all very timely. So um, I'm going to introduce quickly the practice of Noé Martinez, and also I will do like a brief explanation of the exhibition and the components of the exhibition that was on display at OGMA for, for the past few months. So Noé Martinez is a great friend and, and an artist that, uh, I mean, her, his practice normally analyzes like different strategies no, of, of the legacy of the native people or the original towns of Mexico before the Hispanic occupation and genocide. And of course, uh, the consequences that the colonial period uh, still, I will say they still have in the complex panorama of the actual Mexico. No? Uh, Noé, for me, works always in between artistic research and activism. Uh, he's always trying to who has been trying to reivindicate the legacy and the traditions of indigenous cultures, um, empowering, but also recovering languages, like the language and, and highlighting the importance no, of, of memory as a sort of political tool. And he, for this, he used like a variety of methodologies no, to approach these themes that are like ethnographic research, uh, researching in uh, historical archives, translating themes, but also digging no, in his own family history that he will talk about that deeply uh, uh, on this uh, today. So however, something that is for me super important uh, uh, to highlight when I talk about Noé, that Noé is talking about indigenous tradition and communities in Mexico in a very active way, that they are still alive, they're not people from the past, and also how the cultures and traditions has been changing and adapting no? over, over the years. So it's not something static. Um, and of course, many of these changes were part of course of the violent past uh, as a result of the Spanish occupation but it's definitely and it's definitely a, a history of neglection and domination but uh, it's also I think this past was also able to provide certain like put together different transatlantic stories uh, from different point of view uh, always from the point of view of oppressed people and um, I have to quote very shortly like the Martinique poet Edouard Glissant, because I think the whole exhibition has a lot to do with Glissant for me, that this idea of relation is not made up of things that are foreign, but of shared knowledge. And this experience of the abyss, of like the emptiness, can now be said to be the best element of exchange. And that's something that I think is very present in Noé's exhibition. So the homeland of the images, La Patria de las Imágenes, uh, just to explain a few comments, 
Bonet, I think you collage as a political strategy. And uh, basically what NOE is doing is combining through uh, free associations, I have to say. I mean, of course, like some historical associations, but a lot of free associations also like um, creating parallelism between different cultures, uh, mixing official and personal stories, but mostly linking context and establishing analogies on the history of European colonialism and in America and in Africa. So. Although, of course, research on Afro-descendant communities in Mexico is something that, like, sadly, has not been, let's say, investigated <laughs> uh, that much. Uh, in the past few years, there are, of course, like some uh, individuals and organizations that are, in a way, demanding a little bit of recognition and, and visibility no, of these uh, communities. So I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit. I mean, Noé will introduce, like, in deep all the components, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about what the exhibition was about and which kind of components were there. So the whole exhibition was like basically- um, Sorry, Ruth. Um, Melanie, could you please put the PowerPoint up so we can see the images? Thank you. Good. So um, uh, yes, so basically the whole, they were like a, a group of paintings, but all the paintings were like a sort of installation all together. So they work as a whole in a way. So um, what the, each image of each painting was composed of many different things. So I will enumerate some of the things that for me are like, like important. So there were many uh, images and reproductions that Noe was doing that were coming from the field of the ethnography. And it's funny because many of them, well, not funny, it's interesting that many of them are as part uh, of the research that was done by the French ethnologist Guy Estresel-Pen that was a French ethnographer uh, that lived in Mexico for many, many years. And they were as part of the French archeological and ethnological mission in Mexico. Yes, to explain very quickly, it's like, of course, many uh, of the studies on pre-Hispanic past were carried out by Europeans, ethnographers. Uh, that's something that happened, of course, uh, all over the world. And it was through their vision somehow that the, the, the history was interpreted. So in a way you will find a lot of images that were basically like photographs or drawings done by these ethnographers. And Noé is doing like a, like a second interpretation of already an interpretation of, of that. So, um, so many of these images are also part of like uh, cultural and tradi indigenous traditions that have, and in a way they are still very active. So for instance, you, you can have like a drawing of dances without their mask during the dance of the Mecos, that is a, a, a dance that is originally from the Huasteca, or like a, a mannequin, a sort of doll of a Nahua carnival celebration that is also from the municipality of Madero in Veracruz. So you have many of these images that he is in a way reproducing through painting. But also uh, there are a lot of uh, pictures that he took in what he called this kind of field trips. Uh, and uh, many of them are from La Antigua and the coast of Veracruz. And uh, just to explain that this was the first place founded by the Spanish colonizer Hernán Cortés. And many indigenous slaves were sent from this geographical point to different locations in the region. And there are also some images of the ocean, the same ocean, the Atlantic Ocean that Glissant again is many times describing in, in the writings as this ocean of separation and one trip, only one trip um, uh, travel. So you have um, also like a lot of clippings from newspapers. For instance, you have like, um, he was pretty focused for instance in this magazine that was published back in the forties in Brussels, the Illustration Congolese, the Congolese illustration that was pretty much uh, a newspaper that was reporting, but also celebrating the news about the colonial occupation of Belgium in Congo. Uh, that was, as you know, like for almost 50 or 60 years uh, until really recently, until the 60s. And of course, although they are not a direct relation between the colonial past in, in Mexico and the Belgium in Congo, I mean, Noé is trying to establish certain relationships between both moments in, in history. So, um, uh, other things that you can uh, you can see in the on the canvases on the paintings is like small objects that are reproductions and how certain objects that were used in the colonies. So, for instance, you have this kind of silver chains with letters that refer to the iron letters to imprint the slaves during the period of the New Spain in Mexico. Letters that show the cause of their slavery, but also the name of the person to whom they, they belong. So, um, and you also have um, different fabrics 
that are basically painted or dyed with, uh, with plants and other motifs, like botanical motifs. And these images refer to ancestral traditions. But the interesting thing about these small fabrics and paintings is like, they're not just a reproduction that Noe is doing from, from something, but really he is redoing the ritual again. He's reproducing again the, the, the performance of doing this sort of element. Again, because I think something that for me is very important always with Noah's work is like he's always like representing, but also doing the act of creating this project. And again, highlighting that there are these kind of rituals that are still very present in today, but has been changing, of course, over the years. And, um, and finally, uh, but that's, one of the medullar part of the work is like all these paintings, they have like a back with text. And these texts are written by hand, so in a way, and they're actually kind of difficult to read because they are kind of images, like images of text in a way. And they are poems that were originally written in Spanish and after translated with her, his family also in Nahuatl. Um, and, uh, and afterward translated in English for the, for, um, for uh, the exhibition. And um, as probably you know, but just to clarify that the Nahuatl is, a, is, a, is an Aztecan language that is still today quite alive and is spoken by about a million and a half people in Mexico. And it's uh, uh, the mother tongue of, of, uh, of the family of Noé Martinez. So in a way he was a collaboration with his family to do these poems and to translate this, this poem. But something that is important for me about that is like, uh, I think this duality between text and image is also like, an story, like a history of visibility and invisibility, I think. As you, everybody knows, of course, language is power. Language is a way of understanding the others. Language is a way of thinking, not only a way of speaking, of course. So for me, this idea of recovering the language is about talking about how one of the one of the ways that the Spaniards, of course, used to colonize was like by deleting, by erasing the languages. And um, so that's why in the paintings of, of Noé, like the text is there, but it's difficult to read in a way. So it's, it's like uh, the only way for this communities to survive was through images somehow, even if this image, they, they are present through relics or through, uh, through ruins sometimes. So these are a little bit the components of this installation, but I think I, I'm going to um, pass the word to Noé Martinez, the artist, and also to Andres Resendez. We're very lucky to have Andres here because he's I think he, he could speak deep in many of the issues that I was mentioning now. And I'm going to read very briefly uh, who they are so you have a, a better context of, of their career. So just saying about Noé Martinez, I'm not going to repeat about his practice because I was already explaining <laughs> quite a lot, but he has exhibited in many different institutions in the past few years, like uh, here in the state at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, at the MCA basically, and also at the Amparo Museum very recently with a beautiful exhibition at the Carrillo Hill Museum some years ago, the Palazzo Mora in Italy, the Art Center Kunstquartier Betania in Berlin, and, and, and so on. Uh, and Andres Resendet, he's a, a professor of history and an author, and his specialities are early European exploration and colonization of the Americas, the US-Mexico border region, and the early history of the Pacific Ocean. His latest book is The Other Slavery, The Uncovered Story of Indian Enslavement in America. And uh, it's a book that was uh, a finalist for the 2016 National Book Award and winner of the 2017 Bancroft Prize from Columbia University. He teaches courses on food and history, Latin America and Mexico. And his next book that has a long title is Conquering the Pacific and a Known Mariner and the Final Great Voyage of the Age of Discovery. It's about this tumultuous expedition, sorry, that first went from America to Asia and back, that's transforming the Pacific Ocean into a vital space of contact and exchange in 1565. And it's, uh, it's forthcoming in September. 2021. So I hope I, I will read it for sure. So please, Noe. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know if Cassandra has to explain or remind. I mean, this idea of the the translation. But uh, that's, look, I was just thinking that since I think some people might have joined us since uh, I initially introduced the program, but it, Noe will be speaking in Spanish. But you can all see there's a little icon at the bottom of your screen on the right um, bottom of the the little bar across the bottom. Uh, 
there's a, it's a little globe symbol and if you click on it, um, you can pick English, Spanish or um, off. And if you wanna hear Noe being, we're having, uh, we have a simultaneous interpreter who's um, going to be interpreting Noe as he speaks. So if you wanna hear in English, you just click, click on English um, and uh, you'll be able to hear the interpretation of Noe as he's giving his presentation. Um, feel free, it won't, you know, there's, it's fine for you to try and toggle back and forth if you um, want to try out different settings. So, Noe, I will hand it over to you. Hola, eh, muchas gracias. Eh, muchas gracias al... Hello everyone, thank you so much. Those of you who just sign in, Thanks, Cassandra, Ruth, everybody, Andres also. I'm very happy. This project has had so much energy put in by everyone with a topic that is so complex that both in Mexico and in other countries like the United States, we are able to talk about this openly nowadays. Although it's complex to talk about enslaved people, about bodies being transported as merchandise. And especially since all the, the movements, the protest in the streets in the United States uh, of Black Lives Matter, I'm very grateful to the Okma Museum. Now, I haven't been able to, to go and see my own exhibition because of the pandemic. I've had also a lot of work. Uh, several months ago is when we started preparing this, this exhibition. And uh, in the particular case of Ruth and I, we are friends since some time ago. And we decided to put this together, this project. And thanks once again to the Orange County Museum of Art for having us and supporting us throughout this process. This project obviously speaks about slavery, but in a sense of continuity, not just those first times of colonial times, but how some of these effects are still present on the, in the people who live nowadays in different, uh, from that colonial times, we learn different ways to, to relate to other people. And I want to really stress all these movement or transportation of bodies of people. Okay, and I try to think about those days, that those, those actions and how I see myself and my culture nowadays. And how even my own culture was traded as slaves in the 16th century in Mexico. I also want to, to relate or think about nowadays the, the social movements from one country to another, which immigration from one country to another is very important for me. When these big movements of huge numbers of people happen, uh, lots of relations are broken. So the, we become like pieces, we're broken. And then we need to put up the piece, we put back the pieces together back together. Uh, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's speaking in Spanish and I'm speaking in English for him. Uh, but you know what? Even Spanish is not my native tongue. I speak a, a, a tongue of the native people of Mexico prior to the colonization by the Spaniards. And it's also a language that, to be honest, I have forgotten some of it. So because we are caught in Mexico, in my case, I'm caught in the middle of different cultural uh, clashes. So that's why I've lost some of it. And we are, a lot of people, we're in the same, in the same situation. Now, talking about, you know, this very subject, this project is a very personal project of mine, something that is very important for me. It has been a gradual process that started from working with my family, to have this communication with some relatives in the city of Morelia, and others on the city of San Luis Potosí in the Huasteca zone in Mexico, 
that is closer to the Gulf Zone in Mexico. And Morelia is closer to the Atlantic, sorry, to the, sorry. And we share a lot of uh, cultural traits with other native cultures in the Americas. I'm trying to put the pieces together of my native tongue again and see what's, what was going on with the original uh, Huasteca region in Mexico because the maps have changed over time, over the centuries. So I wanted to know what happened. So I began learning that, you know, in all documents in the archives of Mexico, you know, it used to be given another name. It was called the province of the Panuco. And from there, the peoples, native peoples of um, the Huasteca region were being shipped overseas as slaves. And to be really honest, there isn't too much information on the subject. It's a gray area. So I had to, you know, to build up and find a lot of information on my own because there isn't much available. So, and also because I'm an artist by definition and a researcher, I'm, I try to be one too, but I'm an artist first. So I had to use my intuition. And and ultimately I had to, as an artist, I had to put together how it would look, uh, what kind of paintings, what kind of artwork I would show to represent all this story, all this history, all this movement of bodies from Mexico uh, being treated as animals and sold as slaves. Um, sure, Andres will help us a little bit here. He's also an expert on the subject. In the sense, so I'm dealing, I'm, I'm diving into this topic of slavery. Now the display right now, the Orange County Museum of Art tries to reconstruct symbolically since we are not able to reach, to, to hit it right on the nail, but I'm trying to replicate a slave ship. Um, you know, these boats, these ships that were used to transport the bodies of people from one place to another. In the case of the people from the Huasteca region, Huasteca natives, they were being sent over to the Caribbean as slaves. So all these bodies, just imagine they were all crammed in inside the boats. And I was thinking about that as I was, you know, I went, I went over this while I was trying to prepare my, my exhibition. My, so I came up with, you know, a series of drawings, all right, that represent families that were like taken apart, dismembered, because oral tradition also tells about this, of this treatment that was given to the to, to people similar to what was happening to, to the peoples of uh, people who were who suffered slavery, whether it's at the factory um, and the plantations and different other places where work conditions are very poor. Yeah, and I just think about the conditions back when it was the colonial times that were very, very, very poor. One of my direct relatives Okay. but they were so talking about my family you know there are histories of of survival okay and i wanted to have to bring life to these bodies all right and show them in in my exhibition and, and they have different in different forms from archaeological drawings some of them through my, my own work. You know, I, I'm taking also some from my own work, my, my own drawings. Some of them are, are drawings that I found in other archives. And I use fabrics that have been treated using different techniques, basically using a healing plants that are still being used today in the, in, in the region of the Huasteca in, in ritual ceremonies, ritualistic ceremonies. All these origin or this bunch of images that have, well, while they are not, uh, they are don't represent a linear historical you know, 
way, but they are more like chunks, chunks in history. But for me, they delve deep um, into this wound that came from colonial times. And for me, as an artist, I, I, I use this as a way to create. I use this material. It shows part of me. And for me, it's very important as an artist to have this relationship with each of the elements that are in my artwork. We, we attempt to replicate the sea, the boats, like in Veracruz. And the way I, I, I sh I'm showing them is like if it was a picture. And then I use a different filter for the, for the camera, the way they were developed. And all these relations uh, with the materials is in order to, to, re to reconstruct and, and to try to get all that memory that was lost and and to see what's what what is about this country what, what happened with with the uh, these people like what is left of my original my native language the um, the handmade processes to create materials painting materials I uh, and so I'm I'm appealing to my intuition I fall back on my intuition to try to get into this this archive that is that is lost. I also owe great, great debt to literature. I owe it a great deal of what I was able to research. And I also got a huge information or a huge inspiration from a novel by an African author by the name of Ben Okri. The name of the novel is The Famished Road. Now, in this book, the author tells us about these spirits who are able to go in and out of the lives of people at different times. They're called abikus. That's a word in African. So they're able to to enter or exit in different into different the lives of different people at different times in their lives. So there is a, a series of images that I'm including that are cutouts from a diary uh, from the from Bel from Belgium. And this this diary or this newspaper from you know from last century, I saw these images that also show the impact and the effects of colonization. They show the exchange of bodies, in exchange of animals of, in, as it happened in the Caribbean. They where they would exchange uh, several number of human people or bodies for for cattle, that happened in the Caribbean. And and you know so I included in my work uh, fragments of letter yeah i also included the initials uh, that are supposed to represent the names of the of the owners uh, who took these wastic natives and sold them as slaves or exchanged them for cattle so this is about showing how human bodies were exchanged for for was as objects as merchandise Even the body of these peoples, native natives peoples became merchandise and it still is in, in a certain way. So in, in this sense, for me, it was very important to, to, have, to have the past relation, sorry, the past reality and the present reality and follow different historical lines and interpret our relations, relationships with, with ourselves and with what, what our past held, what was our past. And in, in, since our country, Mexico, is, is a very classist country, for me, because of my my skin color, it's, it's difficult to access all places in the city because of you know this situation with classism and racism. On the back of the drawings, you can see some poems and texts that I translated along with my family. So we all translated them. It's very important for me because it's a way to find pieces of the variables of Nahuatl that was spoken by my family, that is still spoken by lots of my family member, members in my family. In a way, this language, so, 
how we can talk about spelling. We can talk about interpretation of topics that have to do with with uh, with contemporary art. And this this is about activating these terms of different way, different ways to to name the world and and assert ourselves. And all of these poems talk about my relationship with different different topics to see where I'm standing if, if in face of different topics, especially uh, the transportation of, of, of human bodies from the Americas to uh, different parts of the world. Understanding the sea, how it was used to do these, these uh, very lowly, uh, very low uh, trafficking human, that's very low. And um, I find myself um, in a series of, of words that I, now that I heard when I was when I was little, that I had forgotten. And so this this exhibition, the Homeland of Indians, talks about that too. So it's also a way to refer to your early childhood, my early childhood. And I and I wanted to be there to to place myself there. With that, uh, trying to find that that history, that is not pink, that is not. That, that actually for us who belong to the original native people of the Americas, it can be hard, can be painful because you, well, we face and we know we are, a, we are being segregated, we are being uh, discriminated against, but I wanted to give myself this opportunity to, to try to put together this exhibition. So just so that, so to wrap up, to wrap up, I wanted to, to read a small, a small fragment of one of the, of the texts that are on the back of one of my drawings or my artwork. And here it goes. I'm, I'm going to try to do this slow for the translation. This is a fictitious conversation that I imagine uh -huh, with this guy who was the governor of, of the big province of the Panuco. Yeah who saw and who approved of this huge amount of bodies being shipped over as slaves. So when I wrote this, I was imagining myself speaking to, to different or addressing different different leaders. Uh -huh. And I imagined people going out to, to demonstrate against all this. And in this context, that's when I wrote, you know, this, this first text. I'm going to read one for you. So he's talking to this, to this High Majesty, which is the governor of this province. So he speaks in this formal language. You were to, you traverse through this okay, after four hours and slow journeys in the city of Mexico. How did you come here? How are how did you find yourself in this region? You went ahead of me. You are an intruder again. Are you sure you remember of the Panuco? You became, you turned black, your body turned black. You have this face with which you kill, you have when you kill the father of the father of the grandfather of the father of the grandfather. You were the governor of Panuco for one year. 20,000 natives were lost, were sent to the Caribbean. They just disappeared. You just sent them over. They died, some of them in the belly of the big monster in the ocean. I was a part at that time. Uh, it seems that you also sent other people, other families that you dismembered. Sir, one fraction of a memory is lost. I recognize you, Nuno, in those times. Uh, hundred thousands of people saw you and saw you on, on, the, on the media. You feel more omnipresent than five centuries ago. Do you really think that we reincarnated in objects?
you were able to, you were able to to ride on Cortez's shoulders. You've been multiplying there are parts of you everywhere and names that have decided to do things and for that they lose memory and they lose themselves because they are no use they are not useful anymore to you. And the thing is, Nuno, that over this time I've grown to know you. You've, we know each other for years. We have run into each other. And some of us have looked for you and we are angry to wake up and and find out where in the oblivion did you did you end up at? The best for us is oblivion. This was this is an exercise of just imagining uh, the past and the present. It's also a way to understand myself in this historical line of continuity and to place myself as a, as a body in those fragments of history that I have, that I have been researching and digging up. I would like to to have Andres to to speak up. And thank you so much for joining me. I'm so happy, I'm very excited. I wrote to you a few weeks ago and to, I wrote you an email and I was very happy to get your reply and to, to have this generosity from you uh, that you are sharing so much of what you have researched and I owe you a great deal. This work owes you a great deal. Thank you so much. And this is your book and uh, you signed my book, you autographed in my book and it put things clearer to me so that I knew where to, I had to continue you know, my work, not just intuition, but to follow. And um, I'm so glad to be able to talk to you through this uh, platform. And uh, well, thanks, thank you. Well, I'm gonna do this in English. Um, so first of all, um, I want to uh, express my my heartfelt thanks to Noé, who sent this email out of the blue. And little did I know that I would find this artist historian whose, uh, whose work was deeply, uh, deeply knowledgeable of the uh, history of this region, which is uh, really key in the history of Mexico, in the, in the history of colonialism. And uh, this is not, I'm not gonna, this is hardly a, a history lesson, but I would like to, say a few things that will help perhaps uh, put in context Noe's work uh, in a little bit more historical context. He uses many things, as he said, uh, novels, etc. But history is clearly a key component of his work. And so I would like to expand a little bit of this. Um, and, and let me just start out by saying that there are at least two different slavery, two major slaveries that are unfolding in this region. Uh, the one that we uh, normally think about, uh, at least in the context of the United States, when we think of, of uh, slavery, um, Mexico also had um, African slaves. Um, and so, uh, in fact, if you go, there's a fantastic uh, website, uh, Slave Voyages, which uh, really sums up uh, all the historical re research that has gone on uh, in this area. Uh, really documenting all the different uh, voyages from Africa, where they originated and where they ended. I'm showing you these, uh, this image that will be familiar to many of you. And what is really interesting to me here is that the width of the lines uh, represent the number of African slaves forcibly transported across the Atlantic. And you can see that uh, the part that goes to Mexico, uh, to Veracruz specifically, which is just south of the region that Noé Martín's family is from and that he is uh, he's, um, telling, um, is, uh, is a very thin line. Uh, which uh, but nonetheless, so, you know, research is uh, still spotty as, um, as, um, as, as somebody was saying earlier, as Ruth was saying earlier, um, but, uh, but we know that probably some 200,000 um, uh, slaves ended up in Mexico, which is a, a significant number. They, uh, they were uh, all over, uh, not only in plantations, not only in the coasts, but throughout Mexico in 
uh, urban settings, rural settings, in mines, in sugar plantations, uh, et cetera. Um, so, so this is a very an important uh, slavery that clearly is alluded in Noe's work. Uh, but um, another type of slavery that uh, looms even larger in this region and also in Noe's uh, work is Indian slavery, which is something that in the context of the US uh, people are less familiar with. Um, and this is something that the Europeans did not invent. Uh, Native Americans for millennia had enslaved one another as it is very clear in many uh, places all over the Americas. So here I'm just showing you a beautiful fresco from Bonampak in the Yucatan Peninsula that shows Maya overlords uh, clearly standing over, uh, here on the on the upper left uh, corner. Um, overlords uh, standing over what are clearly slaves and on the lower right corner you have uh, the Codex Mendoza, El Codice Mendoza from around the 1550s, so a couple of decades into the colonial period um, in which um, Aztec uh, warriors are holding by the hair individuals. And if you, you can't, it, maybe it's too small for you to read, but you can see that it says in the gloss, the Spanish gloss, it says cautivo, captive. Um, and it was so common that that was the pictorial representation of slavery in some of the early codices. So it existed. But of course, with the arrival of Europeans, this type of uh, slavery expanded uh, in scope and in numbers. Um, and so uh, interestingly, the first home, of course, as, as, as most of you will know, the first home of Europeans in the New World were the uh, Caribbean islands. And these Caribbean islands were very significant because they, um, some of them, especially Española that you see there, the large island, currently shared by the Dominican Republic and Haiti, as well as neighboring Cuba, uh, turn out to have the largest gold uh, mines um, in the Circum Caribbean region. Uh, so I'm, this is a, 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 another view of the island of Hispaniola showing how in the, in, right around here in the central region of Hispaniola, um, Spaniards found the largest gold deposits, and these led to a first gold, the first gold rush in the Americas, um, that was um, that required a lot of uh, indigenous labor. Um, it was done. So, so what I'm showing you is this incredible image by a chronicler named Oviedo, a Spanish chronicler um, uh, Oviedo, who was himself a um, gold prospector and miner. And, um, and in this drawing, he showed us how it was done. So basically, these early miners would uh, get uh, three, it was a quadrilla, as it was called. So it was a group of Indians divided into three different groups. Uh, one group, as you can see on the right, represented by the figure on the right hand side, would do some superficial digging, preferably close to a river or a stream, as you can see there in the image. Uh, then a second part of the crew uh, would carry the sand in very large wooden pans called bateas, as you can see the, the figure in the middle. And a third figure, often women, uh, would be devoted to receive these bateas and wash away the sand until the last little bits of gold would remain at the very bottom. Um, and this, uh, this activity essentially uh, structured life around the Caribbean island in the early decades in such a way that uh, natives in Hispaniola, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, as you can see there, um, were, uh, you know, the, suffered a cataclysmic decline of indigenous peoples. And pretty soon, slavers had to venture out into other places in order to procure Native Americans to bring them to Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and Cuba to take them to the places where they would serve um, as labor. Uh, in fact, in those days, Spanish often called the Bahamas, as you can see them right north, uh, they called, or Lucayas, they also called them. They also used to refer to them as the useless islands because there was no gold or any other marketable commodity except humans. And so they capture them or in the coast of Florida. Um, so this is the context of these Indian slavery. And of course, 
Uh, that also extended to the Gulf of Mexico coast uh, in what is Mexico and in what is the region of Panuco, which is where Noé and his work unfolds just north of uh, Veracruz, which became the entryway, the primary entryway from Europe to, um, to Mexico. Um, um, I should also say, and I don't want to overstay my welcome here, that, uh, but just for the sake of clarity for, uh, for those of you um, coming to this um, exhibit, uh, that at the time, um, the, uh, the way it worked is that the Spanish monarchy uh, uh, established contracts with conquistadors, patents of conquest, that very clearly stipulated areas in which these overlords or these conquistadors would have sway. And so um, the, the uh, image, oops, sorry, let me just go back. The uh, area um, of where uh, Noé's family coming from, you can see uh, Panuco was given to this individual Nuno de Guzman that Noé was having this dialogue with. Um, and he was uh, the man in charge of that region. Uh, it was a very significant region um, because uh, by the time uh, Nuno de Guzman got there, he uh, conceived of the idea of sending natives from this region to the islands that were, as we saw, emptied uh, and needed badly needed human labor. Uh, but they had lots of animals, especially horses um, and uh, cattle. And so the cattle ranching economy of the Gulf of Mexico, which e eventually would extend all the way to Texas, uh, originated in this exchange of humans. Um, some, you know, to the some researchers have actually established the the precise uh, equivalence: fifteen humans for one uh, head of cattle. Um, and so that's those early uh, th those early herds that were introduced, uh, multiplied, and are were responsible for the later uh, boom. Um, so this is uh, so this is what we have. This is. Uh, an image of this Nuno de Guzman, this governor of the region of Panuco. Uh, he was from the Codex Teleriano Remensis, another 16th century codex. Um, he was the instrument selected by the Spanish monarchy to try to counter the enormous influence of the Mexican conquistador Hernán Cortés. Um, and so the two became great rivals, and he was a man of great conviction, great religious conviction, but also uh, great cruelty and decisive action. Um, so, um, so anyways, I, um, in the end, uh, this um, slavery would continue, just to add in, add in a, a, a note that will tie this to the present, um, and Indian slavery Contrary to what happened to African slavery, that eventually was, um, I mean, eventually was uh, resulted in an abolitionist movement. In the case of Indian slavery, it became illegal. However, it happened de facto uh, in undercover ways, in clandestine ways, uh, ways, and therefore it became a lot more difficult to eradicate, and it uh, survived beyond um, African slavery and in some ways continued well into the 20th century. So I will stop here and um, we have half an hour for questions or comments uh, if, you have, uh, if you have them. So thank you. Thank you so much, Andres and, and Noe. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A and I will happily read them for our panelists. Um, such interesting and um, compelling presentations. Cassandra, is, sorry, it's a question there, but it's in Spanish. So I don't know if uh, somebody wants to, or if Andres, you want to read it and answer it. I'm not sure. OK, let me see. Um, I think it's in the chat. Yeah, it's in the chat, yeah. Okay, so the question is, I will translate it into English, is that, uh, okay. Thank you, yes. So, um, so hello, Andres and uh, Noé. Uh, in reality, this project interests me a great deal. I remember having read that the uh, Indian slaves from Mexico taken to the Caribbean, uh, 
left the bones in the plantations and later were, um, were replaced by African uh, slaves um, exclusively. Yes, um, so, um, uh, so, so clearly, eventually, what happened was that uh, this early wave of uh, Indian slavery in the Caribbean specifically was replaced by a much larger group of, um, of African slaves. If you go back to the map that I showed you, one of the largest arrows went straight to the Caribbean islands because mortality was so great. So there were lots of African slaves that were taken there. If you remember, and I, I mean, I'd be happy to put the image uh, back, but if you remember the United States, for example, itself did not have a very wide arrow because, uh, because the temperate climate allowed uh, slavers to actually reproduce their slaves at much higher rates than in the Caribbean. So the Caribbean constantly needed replenishing of African slaves. And that explains that and Brazil, that explains why the vast majority of those slaves uh, went to these uh, regions. Um, however, having said that, so so indeed you are the uh, you know the uh, you are right in in that the exportation of uh, slaves from Mexico to the Caribbean islands ceased, uh, but uh, but it was not the case in um, in Mex within Mexico. Basically, that flow of uh, Indian slaves was uh, redirected towards the silver mines. Just as this chapter was ending in the 1550s with the slaves being shipped to the Caribbean, uh, silver mines were being discovered on a massive scale in Mexico. Um, and so the slaves were now shipped to the, to the silver mines of Mexico. And that's another, another story, but a very, uh, a, a very large scale and very, uh, very somber sto story. So thank you. I have a question for Noe, if uh, there are, uh, oh, I do see some, Never mind. I will read some, they're, they're coming in <laughs> all of a sudden. Um, we have one that asks, could you show more of the images? Some, some of us have not seen the exhibition. Um, so maybe, Melanie, you could put the PowerPoint up again. Um, and then there are a couple in, um, Oh, so I'll, I'll read one that's that's in English and no, I, it's for you. So maybe, I don't know, Andres, if you want to translate it, uh, but uh, there's one at, at the bottom here that says, I've learned and been moved so much. Thank you for your historical perspective and for the artistic work. Your upside down figures seem to be hanging. Was there lynching or is that too literal? So Andres, if you could translate that for Noe and then Noe, if you could answer that question. Ok, Noé, ¿me, ¿me escuchas? Sí, 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 te escucho. Ok, um, he escuchado y me ha conmovido mucho tu perspectiva histórica y tu trabajo artístico. Eh, tus figuras que están boca abajo, que parecen estar colgando, uh, ¿eso era un linchamiento o es demasiado literal? Ok, no, no es un linchamiento. No es un linchamiento was just to display the bodies so that when you don't see the face at the top, they lose that their humanity. So you imagine something else, so you don't look at them as humans. And that's the explanation. You can punish about, you can think about a punishment, you can punishment whatever you want, but it is like, a, like a display in a shopping, in like a shopping window display that shows that these humans, these people are not humans. They were deprived of their humanity. That was the intention. That all images should look uh, uh, topsy, uh, the other way around. up of an object or like like ups and down not not only the body so i think this idea of like cutting or like uh, the yes it was something it's a, it's a strategy that you were using with different things not only with bodies i guess thank you ruth and, and no uh, uh, sorry there are some other questions should i read some other yeah, questions I was gonna say, Andres, could you could you read some of those um sure 
so one uh, Maria Sosa asks uh, whether the uh, slavery in Indian slavery uh, carried out by Aztecs and Mayas is comparable to the European type of slavery. That's a good, very good question. Um, very briefly, um, these types of pre-colonial, -co pre uh, pre-Columbian uh, slaveries were very much embedded in very specific cultural contexts. So, um, so Aztecs, for example, uh, procured uh, captives for sacrificial, for, uh, for sacrificial purposes and human cannibalism. And we have many other examples all throughout the Americas. For example, in the, what is now the Northeast of the United States, the Iroquois people conducted what was called mourning wars. So that is uh, wars meant to uh, take captives from, uh, from another group in order to replace dead or killed members of one's own group. Um, there was in the Pacific Northwest, closer to where the museum is, um, many uh, elite marriage deals amongst indigenous elites was sealed with the exchange of captives. So all of these were uh, practices embedded in cultural, uh, cultural elements. Uh, so the, the innovation, if you want to call it that way, with the arrival of Europeans was to uh, essentially commodify all of this and loosen it from these um, cultural contexts. And so the networks of enslavement essentially expanded uh, in ways that would have been totally unthinkable before uh, the arrival of Europeans. So you would have Apaches being captured in what is now the American Southwest and taken all the way to Cuba or uh, Filipino natives taken all the way to the silver mines in northern Mexico again. So, uh, so, so that's very briefly what, what, that, what that difference is. Fascinating and interesting. Thank you, Andre. Do you want to read the other one in Spanish? <laughs> um, okay, so Noe, uh, muchas gracias por esta charla tan interesante. So can you, Noe, you can, tú puedes leer esto, ¿verdad? Sí, sí. Ok, eh, ¿quieres? ¿Quieres contestar tú primero? No, adelante, y yo sigo después. Ok. Eh... I think the different disciplines like history and art and the way to, to do research, they are they are like they become like 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 shady the border between the two. And so when I do a work uh, uh, as a historian, um, I'm an artist in you know in by definition, but there are things that for me I consider important like history. So I end up, you know, or working on projects that have to do with both things. I'm not so worried. I'm not so worried that much between what's the border between history and art. I think they both can be tools that can be used jointly. And I think that different disciplines have lost, have lost their borders. I'm thinking about this text by this author, that we, that how the way we, we divide life in different stages, and and and, and math, in mathematics and science, in the end, and in the end, the life or existence trespasses these borders that we set up. And from that perspective, I see my work. I take elements or tools from one place or another, from one discipline or, or another, without considering myself that I'm only going to do, I'm going to become an expert, an academic expert in one or another discipline. But I'm just helping to to create consciousness and how we can relate those things with what is happening nowadays, using ethnographic tools that can help us and can help us elucidate this, this, all these questions. My perspective is, is how we, we can communicate, how different knowledge uh, crosses the border into another area of knowledge. And anyone who is into ecology knows about this, how different disciplines cross the border into another one, cross over into another one, and how different sets of knowledge can give greater possibilities 
to further relationship between these different disciplines. So, uh, I'm sorry, I should have maybe uh, uh, translated this into English. Uh, so both uh, a question by an anonymous attendee and Renata Ruiz ask about the relationship between um, art and history and how the two disciplines can relate to each other and support each other uh, or the conclusions from both uh, disciplines. Um, and so that's what uh, Noe was responding to. And I'm also asked to weigh in on this. Um, I would say that um, that I very much, I was blown away when I looked at these exhibits, even though I've been researching and reading about slavery in Panuco for many years. Um, <laughs> I am just deformed uh, as, a, as an academic historian. I can only go thus so far as the documents will allow me to go and that I can show. Um, and so sometimes just uh, seeing something as crude, as vivid, um, as an art installation like this uh, will, uh, will enhance my understanding of these, which I tend to sanitize as a phenomenon that happened 500 years ago. Um, I will give you just one example. So Noé, in his presentation, uh, mentioned uh, that there were two letters that were actually um, uh, drawn on the faces or in other parts of the, or tattooed in the faces or other parts of the body of the, uh, the indigenous slaves of Panuco. One was R, which was the letter for rescate. So, um, so these were uh, slaves that were held as such by other indigenous groups and the, uh, and the uh, Spanish were ransoming. That was the technical term. So it was okay, even though Indian slavery was more or less uh, forbidden by the Spanish crown, it was okay to ransom Indians. Um, and so they were tattooed with the letter R. Um, and there were other, um, it was also okay, even though it was generally illegal to enslave Indians, it was okay if they had risen up and waged an offensive war against Europeans. And in that case, uh, they were tattooed with a G from guerra, uh, war. Um, and so again, these are letters that I, ha I had known about, but just seeing them uh, in paper or in a, you know, very visually uh, brings another level of awareness of, these, uh, of this historical reality. So thank you. Um, Cassandra, I have a question for, uh, for Noé, but I don't know if I should formulate the question in Spanish uh, and translate in English, or if Andres, you are so kind to translate my question in English. No, so go ahead. Sure, and I can do that. Just do not repeat myself, and I forget what I am saying. So, uh, <laughs> so but Whatever I, you both are comfortable with. Yeah, go ahead. I will formulate the question in Spanish for, for Noé. Noé, una pregunta para ti, quizá una pregunta que nos trae más al momento contemporáneo que al pasado. Mencionabas en, al principio cuando te estabas presentando ¿no? que, que tú eh, como artista, bueno, no como artista, como persona, todavía te sientes de alguna manera eh, marginalizado en muchos en diferentes espacios de la Ciudad de México. Y es verdad que hace unos años, bueno, todavía, debo decir tristemente, el mundo del arte contemporáneo, el mundo del arte en México, no estaba indagando sobre estas cuestiones. Eh, que tú estás indagando del concepto de clase y del racismo que, que hay en México desde los presupuestos que tú haces, pero también porque es algo que te, que te llega a ti desde dentro, quiero decir, por lo que tú representas. Entonces, me gustaría saber un poco cuál es tu posición ahí eh, en México, quiero decir, y también, ¿no, eh? porque eso es algo que hemos discutido tú y yo mucho, si tú te sientes de repente ahora como que esto es un, esto es un problema que, que ha existido por siglos, pero de repente eh, está mucho más en auge en este momento, si te has sentido alguna vez instrumentalizado ¿no? por diferentes museos o espacios, eh, en eh, como, como que están de alguna manera aprovechando tu identidad o lo que tú representas. ¿no? Entonces, eh, primero, sí, en México, ¿cuál es tu posición? Pero luego también que me, que me expliques un poco sí, eh, cómo te sientes en relación a esto porque creo que es algo que hemos discutido tú y yo muchas veces. Ruth, can you tell us what you just asked him before he answers? Okay. Hold on, Noé. Uh, espera un segundito porque Ruth va, va a decir lo que ah. dijo en inglés y luego ah, contestas. Okay, okay. Ah, so I, I should I should formulate the question in English in, in, in English. Okay. Yes, just maybe just summarize it for us, please. 
Very quickly, just saying, we, we, we have discussed many times, Noya and I, during our conversation, that the, the, term, the, the, the theme of racism and, uh, and the difference between classes in Mexico has been a problem forever. I mean, and now it's, it's, it's as present as it was before, of course. But uh, you don't have many artists in Mexico back in time that were really talking about these things in the way that you were doing it, uh, Noé. And, um, and uh, you were mentioning uh, that uh, you have feel in the past, like sometimes, like a uh, little bit marginalized, not as an artist, but also as a person in Mexico City because of your condition of being a person with indigenous heritage. So um, I just wanted to, to ask you again, I mean, how you feel in Mexico in the contemporary area scene talking about these themes, but also if you have feel that you have been instrumentalized as, a, as an artist sometimes because of your identity and what would you represent since it seems that everybody wants to talk about these things right now. I mean, this is something more in the United States. I think in Mexico, museums are not talking about that uh, in the way that they are doing it here. But yes, yes, in both spaces, now how you feel or what is your position as an artist, but also as a person, of course. Okay. Uh... I'm glad that you bring that topic, bring up that topic. It's kind of complex to respond. More than just like give you an answer, it's like to, to, to set up a discussion more than just a single answer, simple answer. The topic of racism is an ongoing work. We have to follow up on it is not just something that is going to change overnight. And it has to do really with the way I can embody all these all these topics that can also translate into uh, either academic, academic concepts or works of art. But for me, as an experience, I, I, it's for me very personal also to, to find out how I was, I was going to present this project, how I was going to, how to create it. And, and the way they look at you in, in Mexico, it, the way that you look is if, whether it gives you access to certain areas, certain places or not. And this is a rem reminder of colonial times. It, ha it has to do with keeping a certain group or groups in an apparent, in a, in a, in a certain segregation state. In Latin America now, we are pondering all this. All this segregation against you when you are not white skinned or when you don't have a certain economical buoyant condition or good condition. And, and if you don't fit in a certain political structure that in which some groups, minorities, they they have, they make all these important decisions in a country, in the country. In that sense, this happens every day. And, and I face it every day when I go to the street, if I go to a bank and I take an aircraft in different situations, I can see it, I can feel it. So it's not like it has to do with, with a certain racial profiling of the individual, of the bodies, and how, how some work relationships are supposed to be with a, for a certain group of people, for a certain race of people, ethnicity. And this is very strong. And this really drives you crazy if you are a rational individual why, this, why does this happen? Like, like you can have this, this freedom to, to do things, but you still have or belong in a, in a ghetto just because of your ra racial um, or ethnicity. So in that sense, yeah, there is a certain uh, ruling class that has and follows certain certain social uh, protocols that go according to their to their ethnicity. And I can and I can tell you that 
that if if we have this opportunity to 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 be an artist and and present our work is not that something that is done automatically it's something that you have to work to have it open and, and we have to try to 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 find the cracks in the system and see how we can access the the, the mainstream through these cracks and the other people have done the same whether they are uh, movie makers uh, dancers and different people who have this 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 knowledge that belongs to the original native populations in Mexico, how they have to, to to find a way to try to get into the mainstream. Same happens with the with the, with the peoples who belong, so who are descendants of African slaves. And there are some programs like social programs that so there is always a risk of being of being used as an instrument to 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 tap into the mainstream and 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 have access to all these uh the social uh, uh opening and the very important thing is uh, whether is negotiation is this instrument is being an instrument for this uh, government uh, procurement um is beneficial for us is it going to bring a change because once again the discussion forums are have always been very monopolized uh -huh. in mexico it happens a lot that from that there is a day for the uh, uh -huh, there's a day where, where they have the government has all these these events and these programs that try to to bring some some um some attention to the original native people, but that only happens once a year or when there is a special celebration. And that is not really inclusion that I am, inc they are including me or they're including the native people. So, so, it, so it's, it's not really that we are being plural you know, as a society. So we have to negotiate that. So if there is a real program, so what what is what benefit is, is this is going to bring? If not, we just end up. Uh -huh. Okay. So and actually, there is not like a like a like a perfect heritage just to be um, a, a, a native of Mexico. I mean, I mean, there is not like a hundred percent like a pedigree. So to 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 say that you are a, a native of a native um, people of Mexico, there are different considerations, yeah, that that make us believe that we are native peoples of Mexico. So it's an ongoing negotiation, and it should be focused on on an open discussion towards an open discussion that is not monopolized by the public agenda by the government. I do believe that art has that power to address different issues in society and has a power to generate a symbolic value, not just economical and can also be become a historical reference. I strongly believe in the power of art to open up these spaces. Uh, there's one open question that I imagine is for Noé. Uh, do you want, quieres leer la pregunta? Um, I'm asking Noé to read the question because it's in Spanish and I can translate into English. It says, hello. What are the elements that form the circle by Fiorenza? Okay. Um, perdón, perdón, me quedé quieto. Eh, era para 
la idea de qué imágenes había de show no también tenía que ver porque yo también estoy viendo las imágenes. I'm also looking at the images of the showroom, of the display, of the exhibition at a distance. So I have learned to see this display remotely because of the pandemic. I would see them where they were hanging on my studio. All right. So I know it's there, but I haven't been able to see it physically. In that sense, I'm not sure that I can to have all these images that I haven't been able to see them at the layout that as it is myself, I haven't been able to see it. Pero creo que se está refiriendo a los elementos que hay en esa en la escultura. Ah, ok. Esto, creo que se refiere a eso. What, what are the elements around this sculpture, ya? Yeah. Ah, ya, me, ya lo estoy leyendo, disculpa. Eh, son una serie de fierros con las iniciales. These are iron bars, pieces of iron, with the initials of slave people. So, with the initials of the owner of the slaves. Some of these slaves were, were branded in the Panuco area. And these initials appear in an archive that I found in one of these old files from the colonial times. And we just worked, we just made some tweaking on these iron bars that were used to brand people. But the way they are arranged in a circle also has to do with speaking with this ongoing thing that circles keep circling and how this one of these iron bars is interlinked with the next one and interlinked with the next one so it becomes a structure a cycle that was generated for me it was very important to see the initials because lots of the Huastec native bodies were tattooed and, and these tattoos must have had a series of connotations. Um, so it becomes like an enigma, we'll see what happened. But, you know, a mark, a body that has brands, marks. Beyond the, the, uh, the importance that, that it's about imagining a person that whose whose skin is being branded using a hot iron. And so. Um, there's another question by Catherine Dealey. Um, are you allowed to exhibit this historical artwork in Mexico? If so, what is the reaction? Eh, entonces, una pregunta para ti, Noé, de si a ti te permiten exhibir este trabajo artístico en México, y si es así, ¿cuál es la reacción? OK. Um, una parte, una parte de las esculturas las exhibimos en part of the sculptures were exhibited in Mexico in the gallery that was supporting my work at that time a gallery that is part of it's privat, privatized, it's a private gallery so so my, my work is not so mainstream the reaction in Mexico ends up being sometimes like surprise because we I'm touching this subject because we're used what we're used to seeing in Mexico is more like like the branded bodies of African people but not really the branded bodies of of indigenous people there is an artistic touch in these sculptures so that has to do with with the physical appearance of the pieces of art with the way they look it has never been in Mexico an exhibition as robust as the one that is showing at the Orange County Museum of Art, where you can see all these display of pieces and, and also the sculptures. And uh, this part of a pro public program for me, this is the first time that I, can, that I can see the fruits of my last two years of my investigation uh, being seen in a, in a public institution. 
where I can show all these, all my research. It's a way for me to test the waters to see the reaction of the people. You, I mean, I, I never experimented like kind of censorship, but like you cannot talk about certain things about, I mean, at least in the in museums, you know, I think you have freedom to do a lot of things. I mean, it's just that you don't have a lot of artists as, as, as Noé talking about these issues because it's not something like here in the States is like everybody, I think in many different ways in different museums are talking about these issues, but in Mexico is something that, uh, yeah, it's not a discussion, even if it's like so uh, present in the, in, in the society, but in terms of freedom or being allowed to uh, present things, I have to say that in Mexico, at least in the museum structure, artists have a lot of freedom in presenting things. And, um, and um, so, yes, I don't think it's a question of censorship or something like that. It's just a question of interest, like what is missing here. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Oh, I mean, in some ways, I think if, do you have, if, no way more, or? I was just gonna say, I think for us, we're really, we're really grateful to be able to um, provide Noe this opportunity. And I hope that it leads to more opportunities in the future in Mexico and otherwise. Um, I think, you know, it is groundbreaking work and it, it is really important for us to learn. And, and I think, this conversation to me in particular, um, the, this relationship between historical research and how art can take us in a, in a sort of deeper into the complexities, the sort of undescribable things that words can't always get at um, is really profound. And I think, um, I don't know, maybe someone can, can translate this part to no way, but this exhibition has meant a lot to visitors here. And I have heard so many really um, profound comments that they've been really touched by the exhibition. Can one of you explain that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Cassandra está diciendo que esta exposición que has hecho ha sido súper importante y que mucha gente ha tenido comentarios súper profundos en torno al, al, al trabajo que se ha presentado. So I think that might be a good, a good place for us to end here today. I want to thank our panelists and presenters, Andreas, Noe, and Ruth. Um, you're all fantastic. I want to say a very, very special thank you to my colleague, Melanie Sarasing, who um, you're not seeing her on the screen, but she has really made this whole program possible today. Um, and um, I'm so grateful always to have her, um, her support and her hard work to make things like this possible for us at, at ACMA. I also want to thank Victor Aguilera, our fantastic Hi Victor um, interpreter. I hope that you all enjoyed and were able to access the um, uh, bilingual aspect of this program easily and that it wasn't too complicated for all of you. Um, thank you again for joining us this afternoon and we'll see you soon.